This morning, Brookfield announced that at least $80 billion worth of Westinghouse nuclear reactors will be built across the United States. And of course, investors are wondering how they can profit from this exciting news. But there's potentially a big problem looming for nuclear developers that investors may not see coming. If you're invested in Oclo or New Scale or any of the other SMR SPACs popping up left and right, then you're going to want to watch this video. So let's talk about the latest big news. The recently announced partnership between Brookfield, Cameco, and the U.S. government promises to spend $80 billion on nuclear reactors. And the reactors they're building are AP-1000s from Westinghouse. They're jointly owned by Brookfield and Cameco, roughly in equal parts. Now, both companies obviously are expected to benefit from this. They're publicly traded, so there's certainly some exposure to be had there. And there's even talk of a future IPO. But we need to first understand the basics here. First obvious question, how much is $80 billion worth of nuclear reactors? We look at Brookfield's press release. It talks about how each two-unit Westinghouse AP-1000 project, so assuming two reactors per project, when it doesn't say how many projects are going to create all these jobs. So would this be four reactors at $20 billion a pop, eight reactors at $10 billion a pop? How much do these reactors cost? So of course we can ask our favorite LLM at the moment, and it tells us that we can look at the two AP-1000s that have been deployed in the United States, currently in Georgia, to see what those cost. And the number turns out to be around 15 to $17.5 billion per unit. However, they were only expected to cost $7 billion per unit, and they say that costs doubled because of rework, licensing amendments, and modular construction learning curves. That's important. It implies that future AP-1000s will be built much cheaper. And when we look over to China, where they have, we're currently building, I believe, 14 of these reactors right now. They have four that are operational. We see that it costs the Chinese about $7.3 billion. The reason that it's that it was so cheap they say is because of lower labor costs supply chain localization and fewer regulatory hurdles that's important so pay attention to that last point there so we can assume that regulatory hurdles as we'll see a little bit later are a key contributor to these cost overruns in the United States and that they're going to be removed in this instance because the US government is so closely involved in this project so if China can build one for seven billion dollars one would think the US can do it for 10 billion so so let's assume that this $80 billion is going to produce four projects with two AP-1000 reactors each for a total of eight reactors. Now, when we look at these particular type of reactors, they're the most advanced commercially available with fully passive safety systems, a modular construction design, and quite a small footprint. They talk about how the six AP-1000 reactors that are currently in operation across the globe are setting operational performance and availability records with 14 reactors under construction. And there are, of course, six operational in the world, two in the USA, and four in China. So the next question would be, well, how long does it take to build these things so we can understand when all this capacity is going to come online? Well, this great article I came across here from the Mackinac Center talks about how the cost of nuclear energy is often misunderstood. That's important. We'll talk about that a little bit here. But when we look at what they're talking about in terms of duration to build reactors, the Japanese will take them anywhere from three to four years, the French between five to eight years, and the Americans, well, they say it used to be at a similar pace to these other countries countries, but that was before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission began to regulate the most minute aspects of construction. So now it commonly takes over a decade to build a reactor in the United States. That's going back to this idea that if you remove regulatory hurdles, then reactors can be built a lot quicker. But there's one thing to notice here, that even if the Americans were able to build one, let's say in four years, three years from now, they're going to have an administration change. And when you look at the term of that agreement between Brookfield and Cameco and the U.S. government. I've put up the details in the partnership structure here. There's an interesting note in there about how they may have an IPO of Westinghouse that the U.S. government might demand. You'll notice the date here, the deadline date prior to January 2029. Well, that's because the U.S. holds its next 
presidential election in November of 2028. So all they're doing here is setting some sort of milestone exit for the deal right before a new administration starts. But it's important to note, I didn't know this, that Democrats and Republicans actually agree on something here, a rare instance in the divided United States of America. You see that both have expressed support for developing nuclear energy, and that's amid, they say, rising approval and the need for reliable low-carbon power. So public support for expanding nuclear power has risen sharply from 43% in 2020 to about 60% today. So that bodes well for the future of nuclear, provided there's no disasters that pop up or anything. You don't hear about disasters in solar, aside from some birds falling out of the sky, but if there's a mistake made in nuclear, it's going to be all over the headlines, right? So let's assume that they start breaking ground on this $80 billion worth of projects at the end of this year. In terms of how long it will take, well, let's assume we can at least keep up with the French. That's a low bar to clear. So key question, how much new capacity will be coming online five years from now in 2031 after spending $80 billion on eight reactors? Well, of course, we can ask Grok, and these are just basic numbers. So they say that this new model of reactor actually puts out 9.34 terawatt hours annually. Well, when we look at the total annual terawatt hours for nuclear in the United States, which is 816, and you compare that to the total U.S. electricity, so 4,500 terawatt hours, tells you a couple of things. First of all, that nuclear energy is currently about 18% of the United States total energy output. And also that if we divide the 816 terawatt hours being produced by nuclear reactors by the 94 operational reactors, half of which are Westinghouse, by the way, we get an 8.7 terawatt hour. So we see a higher power output from these new reactors. And now we're able to calculate how much energy they're going to bring online. So it turns out that today's nuclear news isn't moving the needle too much. In a seemingly likely scenario, we're going to wait five years for our nuclear capacity to increase about 9%. And that boils down to a total electrical output increase after spending $80 billion of about 1.66%. Now, this is where SMR technology promises to come online a lot quicker, and that's what's made Oclo a $20 billion company today with no revenues. And of course, when SPAC sponsors realize how easy it is to make money off SPACs, probably the easiest money some of these folks have ever made, then of course, numerous other nuclear SPACs are following. You see a list of some of the names here, all of which we would be avoiding like the plague because none are likely to have any revenues that relate to their core offering, which would be the small modular reactor, what they call SMR. So these are rated with a electrical power, they say of 300 megawatts or less. They're designed to be factory fabricated. And this term small modular reactor refers of course to the size, the capacity and a modular construction approach. The idea being that we can just start building these things left and right. We don't need to wait five years or 10 years for all these hurdles. These are a lot more easier to construct. The problem is that came across this chart recently. This is produced by Wood McKinsey and it shows how small modular reactors aren't going to be very cost competitive when compared to conventional nuclear and of course when compared to other energy sources. And of course this is somewhat of a contentious topic but I think that this piece here elaborates more and says Wood McKinsey says SMRs will play a small part in the power market through to 2030, largely because high costs are holding back deployment. The decades already passing by and construction timelines mean at best only a few plants will be built. They talk about first of a kind SMR costs of $6,000 to $8,000 per kilowatt. So in other words, when you first start building these things, they're extremely expensive and will consume capital like nobody's business. And there are only six, they say, maybe perhaps, well, there's uh, said to be seven now SMR projects in the pipeline between 2023, they say, and 2030. Now, when it comes to the cost of nuclear energy, we always point to Lazard's levelized cost of energy calculations. And here this article is challenging those, saying that whilst Lazard found that utility scale solar and wind is around $40 per megawatt hour, nuclear is around 175. And that's because they're taking into account the long duration 
operations for builds, the cost overruns, the decommissioning costs, and all that bundled up. And I'm sure that the argument is easy enough to see. Now we're going to produce these reactors a lot quicker. We won't have the cost overruns, etc. So let's assume that conventional nuclear energy is competitive per the following data provided by ACLO. This was taken from their juicy July 2023 SPAC deck. I like here how they talk about how, for them, nuclear is a reliable clean energy solution deployable at scale today. Well, not really, because they're only now starting to deploy their solution over two years later. But anyway, you can see here how they compare their SMRs to advanced nuclear, and you see the costs there, so they're claiming it's cheaper. But what I found really interesting is this. So their initial design, what they're building now is this 15 megawatt reactor that, of course, they say they intend to scale through to 50 megawatts. But if you compare the capacity of one AP1000 at 1,110 megawatts, that means that you'd need roughly 74 Aklo reactors to equal one AP1000. So they better start building them in a hurry, and it appears that they're expected to begin building at least one in the third quarter of this year. They're targeting commercial operations between late 2027 and early 2028. So what? Two years from now seems quite aggressive, right? So investors in this $20 billion company with no revenues are going to want to pay real close attention to that timeline. And there's also plenty of competition here. So, for example, Westinghouse has developed their AP300, which is a scaled-down version of the AP1000. They expect that to be operational by 2027. Presumably, it can be built a lot quicker, the same modular design. It costs about a billion dollars per unit, so it's much cheaper if you start adding that stuff up. But one of the advantages for Aklo, of course, is that it's built on an entirely different technology, so it's designed to recycle used nuclear fuel and costs they don't talk about costs of course but it's generally believed that the reactors they're building are of a much higher quality in terms of their capabilities so not all smrs are the same there's only two operational right now one is in china one is in russia and when we look at this chart here from the nuclear energy agency it shows the smr pipeline there's about 127 designs out there. They vetted 74 designs that are in development. Apparently, only 51 are in the licensing process. And you, of course, here see seven designs under construction or operating the two in China and Russia. What are the odds here that the best design is being used by a SPAC right now, statistically, of the 74 designs out there? Seems quite low, right? So SPACs, companies that debut via SPAC, are a red flag in themselves because there's no institutional vetting process and the over 100 SPACs that we covered during the last SPAC craze handed Joe Retail his ass on a rusty platter. So any company that debuts via a SPAC should be viewed with a great deal of suspicion appropriately. So findings, conventional nuclear development of the type that was recently announced has lead times extending into the next administration, but it doesn't appear that that will pose a problem. However, this big expansion announcement isn't really all that big when we look at impact. And whilst SMRs are expected to sort of bridge that gap, they're based on a new technology that's not proven to scale. And in order for it to be economically viable, it needs to scale fast especially if this sort of technology is expected to put an actual dent in the demand for energy. So it seems obvious that investors in all these new pre-revenue nuclear SMR SPACs that are coming online and ones that are already available are going to be in for a rude awakening over time. Just remember this. It's very important. Maybe one of the most important rules we have in our methodology. The ground truth is always revenues. No revenues, no interest, no exceptions. Now, for those of you looking Looking to invest in the SMR theme but don't want to have to pick a winning horse in the race, you can look at this next stock which provides a advanced fuel called Halyu that's being used by SMRs like Aklo. Give that video a watch next. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this today.